that's how science starts. You make a hypothesis and say, could it be that way? And then you study it. Now we are studying that virus for three billion dollars a year for eight years, and we have no answer. If that happens, then you have to say, this was a hypothesis and that's all it was. We have to look for an alternative explanation. What Dr. Duisberg believes is that AIDS is not an infectious illness, that it is caused primarily by drug toxicity. By virtue of determining to substitute for the immune system by attacking this alien agent with a drug, medicine has literally replaced the body's immune system. What can it do but become weak? AIDS cannot be due to HIV alone. And I have looked at uh, many dozens of studies used to claim benefits for ACT, and there's not a single one of them that I would regard as being scientifically credible. I feel my T cells are up now, the doubling you're referring to, uh, came from use of bitter melon, came from juicing, vegetable juice. If you really want to pinpoint a culprit, it is the power-hungry Food and Drug Administration. It is now headed by a man named David Kessler, I know many of these herbs and these nutrients, without any harm, they've been used for thousands of years in different countries. And all of a sudden, the FDA has not approved them. The first step is to reassure the patient that this is not a death sentence. I'm Gary Knoll, and this is the untold story of AIDS, dealing specifically with the politics. We've been led to believe that HIV is the sole cause of AIDS, that AZT is the drug of choice for treatment, that once you have AIDS that you'll die. As you will see, this is a program that challenges all of these notions. These are the dissidents, these are the unheard voices thus far in the war on AIDS. we can say about HIV, believe it or not, that the HIV epidemic in this country is old. Nothing has changed. Ever since we can detect HIV, one million Americans carry that virus. That was in 85, and it's true in 1992. That is to say, there has been a totally constant reservoir of HIV-infected people, far less than the potential susceptible people. We have 250 million in this country and one million is positive, and that hasn't moved one inch. It is still 1%. But sex has, has been happening in the last eight years, at least so they tell me. They shouldn't say they're HIV positive. They should say they're Western blot positive because it's not clear with this in new information that they have, in fact, been infected with HIV because the proteins that they're measuring for can come from other places. It can come from flu vaccinations. It could come from uh, certain kinds of warts. It can come from, uh, you might have gotten white blood cells from somebody else. The long latent period is, is an unambiguous indication that this virus cannot be the cause of AIDS. Unless, of course, that's he always say in science, unless we find totally new things, radically new properties, in HIV that we haven't found in any other virus or in any other retrovirus. But look at this. Here we have books like this on retroviruses. We have an, in, an, an encyclopedic knowledge on retroviruses accumulated in the last 20 or 30 years. We know hundreds and thousands of them, and so well, better than any other virus. And not one of them does that. There's no way that this virus could, keep, could have a mystery that isn't in any of these books yet, and any of the other precedents. It is always possible, but we have spent a lot of money and time, and 20,000 scientists have studying it for the last eight years, and we haven't found it. Well, I would not personally rule out HIV as having some role in the disease, or at least in this set of diseases. I have not seen anything that would convince me that it's the sole or even the principal cause of the disease. According to the Sunday Times, April 3rd, 1994, there is a conspiracy of silence in the United States. However, there are nearly 450 scientists, including Nobel laureates and physicians and journalists who are suggesting that we must reevaluate the war on AIDS. Included was Dr. Kerry Mullis, Nobel Prize for Chemistry, 1993. As applied to the HIV equals AIDS hypothesis is un 
falsifiable and useless as medical hypothesis. Dr. Stephen Jonas, Professor of Preventive Medicine. Evidence is rapidly accumulating that the original theory of HIV is not correct. There are two or three cases where people claimed, I got AIDS from a patient, two or three. And here we have 200,000 AIDS patients over the last 10 years and seen by a potential reservoir of 5 million healthcare workers and we have two or three hypothetical infections. And that's supposed to be the contagious disease of the century. There's not one confirmed case, not even one in the literature, that a healthcare worker ever got AIDS from a patient. Not even one. And that's supposed to be an infectious disease. We have 20,000 scientists working on it in their laboratories every day. None of them vaccinated, no drug. Nobody ever got AIDS, not one even, from studying that virus. And that's supposed to be an infectious disease. Dr. Fabio Franchi, specialist in infectious disease and preventive medicine. I am not an agnostic. I am well convinced HIV is harmless. If HIV is not the cause, what is the cause? We're talking about going back to the very beginning and looking who knows where, because right now the only medical explanation has been proven false. If it's left at that status, medicine simply is left with nothing more to do. And that's simply an intolerable thing of the sort of renegade who, who approaches this idea is cast aside as a very definite threat to the enterprise. Dr. Roger Cunningham, immunologist. An AIDS establishment seems to a form that intends to discourage challenge to dogma. Dr. Lawrence Bradford, biologist. The cause of AIDS is multifactorial. HIV is neither necessary nor sufficient. The dramatically escalating consumption of psychoactive drugs beginning after the Vietnam War, and we are still going in numbers. The consumption is still going up. That's what we are looking at. And that's where it's restricted. A third, look at it, a third are confirmed IV drug users. That's an illegal activity, very likely to be underreported. Nobody is going to advertise. I call the CDC and say, well, I'm a junkie too. Please put me on your list. Most people will say, I've never used it. I've never seen it. I don't know what it is. And add to this, the junk, the intravenous drug users are the tip of the iceberg. For every intravenous drug user, there are at least 10 who snort it or drink it or take it orally in some way or another or, or pop it in here and there. But they're not going to inject it. That's the most committed and most serious type. Professor Richard Stroman, geneticist. We need research into possible causes such as drug use and behavior, not a bankrupt hypothesis. That explains why it's in 20 to 45 year olds and not in the kiddies and not in the old people. That explains why it's mostly in males because it, according to the Bureau of Justice records, males consume 80% of the heart psychoactive drugs. And that explains even why the infants have AIDS because their mothers are junkies. 70% of, of the mothers of babies with AIDS are junkies. That explains absolutely everything about AIDS. It explains why homosexuals get Kaposi sarcoma because they inhale poppers to facilitate anal intercourse. And that's where Kaposi is. It's in the face, in the lungs, and in their, and in their hands. And the, the, the junkies get pneumonia and tuberculosis because long-term injection of cocaine and heroin through malnutrition and other things which nobody wants to study give you immune defi deficiency and opportunistic infection. That's all that is. And now, in addition, we have a huge reservoir of 120,000 people who get thanks to the US government, ACT every single day. That's the worst talk, that is AIDS by prescription. Duisburg threatened an enterprise, is what he did, because right now our science is governed by funding agencies, governmental, the private, and so on and so forth. I've, I've submitted proposals to funding agencies. What you do is you look at the various proposals available and you write your research grant to meet the proposal or the proposal requirements. Right now in medicine, everything is based upon the assumption that the HIV virus is the cause of AIDS. All the research funding, all the theoretical papers, all the drug development, all have this very same assumption. This entire enter enterprise is now threatened by a man who comes along and says, wait a second, you're on the wrong track. Professor Hyman Catton, ethicist. The orthodoxy will collapse because it flunks the practical tests the AIDS epidemic was a mirage. 
this opens up the door to all the lifestyle measures that medicine has so long discounted. The idea that it could be in the behavior of the AIDS victim. It could be in the diet. It could be in the, uh, the lifestyle in some fashion. This opens the door to an avenue of therapy that medicine cannot accept because it is not based upon their model and doesn't use their drugs. It doesn't rely upon their expertise. You don't even have to know the physiology of the body to be able to teach someone a principle of good living. And so Duisburg simply opens the door to this vast area of, of lifestyle and its effect on health. And if lifestyle is the issue, the doctor can no longer be the physiological authority who cures all. That is simply an unacceptable option. Inner city poverty is, is, is a compounding factor when you talk about disease. That's where the IV drug use problem is. That's where the heterosexual spread is going to be. That's where you're going to see the pediatric cases. So that group needs not only to be educated, they need to be helped in ways that totally transcend biomedical research. They need to be treated for their IV drug use. They need to have the healthcare delivery system improved. They need to get taken out of the squalor of poverty that they find themselves in from birth. So you're dealing with sociological problems that compound the public health problem. My sense of it is that the issues that are not being debated in the AIDS problem are the same issues that are not being debated in general across the board when one looks at the interface between biology and medicine. That is to say that what's not being addressed are those agencies out there, those, those, um, those uh, signals in the environment which are enormously effective in bringing about a disease, those are not being addressed almost anywhere. But what is being addressed is the rather narrower issue of what infectious agents cause diseases, uh, what, uh, what kinds of things go wrong genetically with the organism, either with the organism's own genes or having the organism incorporate a viral genome. These sort of uh, magic bullets in reverse are the kinds of things that the, the, the medical science um, establishment focuses on, and they tend not to look at all at those environmental issues, uh, life habits, um, uh, the presence of carcinogens, of, uh, of toxins in the environment, all these things for which it's very, very difficult to earn a Nobel Prize are being disregarded. There are at least 400 scientists, journalists, and other interested people in the, that group for the rethinking the AIDS hypothesis. Uh, but uh, that's 400 people now. They do include amongst those uh, a, a couple of Nobel laureates, one who's most recent in chemistry, uh, Dr. Curry Mullis, who is the, uh, the inventor of the PCR uh, test, and he uh, is with us. He does not uh, um, support the HIV hypothesis. Uh, why are scientists are this way? Uh, they may be afraid of their grants. I mean, look what's happened to Peter Duesberg. He doesn't have a laboratory anymore. He, he, that, that takes away his credibility as a scientist. He's a laboratory scientist. He's not a theoretical scientist. He, uh, he, they're making him a theoretical scientist, but in fact, he's a laboratory scientist. He's one of the great geniuses. He's well known for his laboratory technique. And, they ha and what has he gained from his courageous stand? He doesn't have a laboratory. I think lesser scientists see that and will keep their mouths shut. Recently, we had a major press conference. All of the media were invited. None showed up. Why is the media so resistant to the story that there are people alive and well who had full-blown AIDS and used natural therapies in the recovery process? You know, that's almost incomprehensible to me. I cannot imagine why that wouldn't be the biggest news story of the decade. But I guess what we have to do is we have to consider them recipients and uh, suckers too, so to speak, a propaganda effort that apparently has worked. If they only have one microbe to warn you about, if there's one virus 
equals one disease. And there's one thing that you should do to prevent it, and that is to have safe sex or not share needles, which is the very simplistic uh, propaganda that we are given by the government and by governmental scientists. That's a very easy message for the press to pick up on. I certainly do believe that the media has a responsibility also. And that responsibility is to report fairly on all of the latest breakthroughs and whatever it may be, be it health, be it technologies, that the media has that responsibility to take a close look and report on what they have been able to investigate and what they have seen as the truth. So what has happened is government propaganda has been translated into editorial style so that there is absolutely no way for a reporter working within that system to question the propaganda because it has become concretized into the actual editorial style of the newspaper. Dr. Charles Thomas, molecular biologist, who says, perhaps the most morally destructive fraud perpetrated on young men and women of the Western world. One of the things that I've noticed over and over again is the hardest thing to get a handle on is the panic. That intense chronic fear. Dr. Alfred Hassig, immunologist. The sentences of death accompanying the medical diagnosis of AIDS should be abolished. The things that we're feeding people uh, emotionally about this disease are uh, uh, are much more deadly than the disease, than HIV itself. The emotional uh, content of HIV infection is 75 percent of the battle. It's down to be uh, to a money-making situation and, and politics, of course. I mean, that's why you have lobbyists out here. I can remember when, uh, when the, uh, the situation started where they were saying, well, you've got to cut back on red meat. You shouldn't eat so much red meat. You shouldn't drink a lot of milk. Of course, you have the dairy lobby and you have the, 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 the meat lobby. And so they're out there against that. A lot of alternate health professionals talk about choice. In reality, because our information is so controlled and so limited through our education, through our media, that people really don't have realistic choices to make in the first place. Now, the doctor says, and the government would say, you know, that's not approved by the FDA. So you can't touch it, you see. But I think it's up to that individual to say, if this is going to help me, if anything is going to help me, because the other thing is not helping me, then I should have the right to try that and not have to be afraid of the government. Physician is the person that should make these treatment decisions. In fact, we have bureaus like the uh, Food and Drug Administration and the National Cancer Institute make these decisions instead. They have taken away discretion of the bedside doctor and instead place that authority into the hands of a bureaucrat in Bethesda or in Washington DC and doctors usually do a better job because they're there they know the patient they're with the patient and so today really the doctor works from a cookbook that is issued out of the federal government and um, and they have to abide by that cookbook or they may be found guilty of malpractice so doctors are practicing defensively and patients are running scared. We are really upset about the fact that 11 years have gone by since this epidemic has been identified and in spite of the fact that out in the field in small clinics all over the country and indeed around the world people are finding methods of survival, of in improving quality of life, extending the length of life, stopping opportunistic infections, and they're doing it using a variety of approaches, many of which are non-toxic, minimally toxic, that use natural medicine, and that use some strategically placed conventional drugs. But all of those approaches, because they tend not to be the high-profit drugs, they're not getting federal research, and of course they're not getting private pharmaceutical money being put into them, and therefore we don't have this knowledge being systematized and spread out to the general public through the, the medical community. What are you trying to gain by this demonstration today? Just to get it more into the public that uh, 
the, the general use of supplements is in great danger from the uh, proposals that the FDA is putting out, that their facts are based on scare tactics uh, and not based in uh, in the clinical facts, and we need to get make this thoroughly known to the public, because most people don't just don't realize what the uh, proposed regulations could entail. Why are we relying on the federal government to do something about this war, and why is it in their hands? Uh, that's a good question. I think that uh, it's probably there, again, because of tradition. Because people have just turned their lives over to someone else. People just don't want responsibility. People can develop resistance against AIDS. Now, every time that's the case, there can be no epidemic. If there's no epidemic, then there's no need for the massive enterprise built up around the AIDS epidemic. I don't understand how medicine discounts so many things like acupuncture and vitamins. Um, I thought they were people in a helping profession who were looking at every way to help people, but they're not. They're only looking at if their way works, and it's all about money. I think it is just a matter of time before the media begins to acknowledge that certain alternative therapies, or, or what are currently being called alternative therapies, actually are achieving a fair amount of success. There seems to be a double standard as far as the doctors are concerned. They'll use many of these drugs that haven't been proven on human beings, and they use them on AIDS patients. But these very same doctors will not use herbs, and they will not use vitamins, and they will not use minerals, because I don't know. Could I say that the bottom line could be the profit motive? I am s suspect about everything involved in this, uh, this AIDS uh, epidemic because it seems only, if HIV causes anything, boy, it co if it causes anything, it certainly causes fundraisers and it raises funds in many different ways. It sells stocks, it uh, supports dances, it has uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, sells condoms and keeps the AIDS establishment going. I mean, the doctors are treated very well by the pharmaceutical companies. They're wined and dined at the meetings. Uh, there is, the meetings are incredible trade shows. People playing with condoms, pulling them over their heads, blowing condoms up, seeing how much air they could hold. All of this stuff goes on. And there wasn't even a lounge for, for people with AIDS. There were, at some of the conferences that I've gone to, uh, they, they, they put a lounge for people with AIDS at the farthest building from the conference on the fourth floor without a couch, without even any water in the room. And uh, they didn't, they had to be reminded, the conference uh, governors had to be reminded that perhaps you could put some water and some fruit maybe, and maybe a couch. And their act up had to carry the couch uh, into the, the room. And then they put guards at the door. The money and the prestige build error upon error into a mountain of misinformation that, that creates viral diseases where, in fact, we should be looking elsewhere for the cause. I would say that disaster, AIDS has taught us that uh, disaster is a career opportunity, <laughs> and it's used that way. I mean, it's something to make yourself famous over, something to uh, get prizes for, something to uh, get some public rec recognition, or uh, something that will make you some money. The technology for AIDS is amazing uh, that they have introduced here. And now, biotechnology, biotechnology, they are going to bring in gene therapy. There's going to be a conference in Florence in April on biotechnology and AIDS. This is money. It's not profitable to cure AIDS. It's simply not profitable. There's a whole empire has been built on AIDS. I mean, there's people that need this now for corporations, pharmaceutical companies. They have a lot of money invested in, in our plight, in my plight. I'm angry about that. The truth becomes lost in the glitter of one side and the apparent mundaneness of the other side. Truth is simple. Truth is ordinary. Thomas Jefferson said he could not believe any matter of the conduct of our life could be a matter of science because he says for every man of science there are thousands who are not. What would become of them? 
Here are the thousands who are not. And I agree with Thomas Jefferson. The truth about the conduct of life is simple, is ordinary. It is about you and I, ordinary people, living our lives in good and, 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 and helpful ways. But that lacks glamour. It lacks newsworthiness. Its only virtue is that it happens to be true. There's every reason to think that AZT will kill you faster um, from an AIDS-related disease than if you were taking AZT because it's a DNA chain terminator. It will kill every cell in your body that's making DNA. I have looked at uh, many dozens of studies used to claim benefits for AZT, and there's not a single one of them that I would regard as being scientifically credible. Now, there are lots of studies of maybe a few people which are merely observed by somebody without a control. Uh, these are more or less in the level of anecdotes. But of the studies used to claim benefits for AZT, uh, all of them, without exception, were financed by Boros Welcome, the manufacturer of AZT, and were controlled by them. And I would say, therefore, they are open to uh, questions simply on this basis alone. The few studies over which Boros Welcome had no control, uh, one of them being a study conducted in Paris by uh, Durnon and colleagues, uh, found no benefits for AZT. And the Concord study, uh, which took place between uh, Britain and France, uh, giving AZT to people who were asymptomatic, also found that there were no benefits to AZT. And perhaps not coincidentally, uh, Welcome did not control this particular study. Over the years, I mean, I've been quite hostile to the use of AZT. I remain so in, with respect to AZT being prescribed the way it was recommended. I think that was, well, I can say it was a, a sort of horrendous decision and one that has uh, resulted in the mess, partly contributed to the terrible mess we are in as far as treatments are concerned. We see the proof like the phase two AZT trial, garbage. AZT should have never been unleashed. We see examples like the Concord study or the Veterans Administration study that say that these approved medicines only benefit the pharmaceutical companies and their stockholders. There's certainly no benefit to people with AIDS. The phase two trials were the basis of the drugs being approved by the FDA for marketing in the United States and also the basis for the drug being approved in 31 other countries. There were all sorts of irregularities. Um, Actual cheating took place in at least one of the centers. And on top of that, uh, the investigators, uh, the people working for the FDA, uh, used data which they knew were bad. And yet this study is still being used to claim that AZT extends life. They tested AZT, it failed. But what they said was, now wait a second, we know it works because the logic is correct. We've proven the logic. We simply have to work harder do more experiments, but we will not give up the logic. So medicine's proof is the excellence of its explanations. The fact that it fails in tests is considered irrelevant because we know the explanations are correct. The original research for AZT said that it, that it killed infected cells at a rate a thousand times greater than healthy cells. But there are now four papers after that original one, which is also a Gallo Bolognese paper, this one, that shows that in fact AZT is quite democratic. It kills all cells equally uh, at the same rate. And in fact that means it kills healthy cells at a rate a thousand times greater than they said it did. Rudolf Nureyev uh, was healthy before he started taking AZT. Uh, he was HIV positive, he was in a state of extreme anxiety and he got tested and he uh, was positive, but at the time he was in great physical condition. It took something like about two years before the ACT finally killed him. They attributed it to a type of heart condition which uh, allegedly was caused by an opportunistic infection. But in my opinion, Rudolf Nureyev died of ACT poisoning. So you feel Brian White's death was due to AZT? Absolutely. Poison. He was taking AZT and had hemophilia, a combination of the two. We helped him die. When people first take AZT, there's the, their white cells do seem to fight back as a natural reaction to AZT. And we will see the, 
the T cells, which is the kind of white cell selectively affected by the AIDS virus, we will see the T cells start to rise, but then in about four to six months, they go right back down again. Um, one of the criteria for AZT failure is uh, T cells 50 points lower than they were before someone took AZT or a T cell count of 50. I think that's being very generous, actually. Uh, we do see T cells march right down to zero, and I do mean zero, while people are faithfully taking AZT. This is a drug that is clearly exerting a toxic effect and not doing anything at that point. By virtue of determining to substitute for the immune system by attacking this alien agent with a drug, medicine has literally replaced the body's immune system. What can it do but become weak? Medicine's model allows no other logic, however, and as a consequence, since the victim is helpless, the destruction of the immune system is irrelevant. He was helpless to begin with. He's helpless when it's over. But medicine has stepped in with a substitute to save the day. Any of the current drugs on the market, primarily AZT, tends to, in I'd say about 30% of the people I've seen, severely uh, weaken their immunity and therefore makes their body have to work harder to have immune strength or power and therefore the body uses up their basic nutrients uh, in the process and really their fighting, body is fighting against the AZT. It's, it's a detriment. Several years ago there was a campaign uh, to get everybody who might be at risk for AIDS to be tested for HIV antibodies. And then if they found that they were positive according to these extremely unreliable tests, they were told that they should um, go for what was called early intervention, early medical intervention. And there were slogans put out, uh, put time on your side. Uh, the early intervention meant purely and simply AZT. And rather than putting time on the side of these people, what the drug did and is doing uh, is to terminate their lives. I think people are out there with AZT in a desperation mood, basically, to use a drug to produce some sort of a short-term benefit, but the cost is a further uh, encroachment on the individual's immune system. So it makes no, it makes no sense except in, as a sort of a psychological, almost a psychoanalytic sociological analysis. It makes no sense scientifically. How do you know which is the disease and which is the effect of the drug. I don't know, and I would challenge a doctor to tell me. We grow up in systems that are essentially natural, that are a byproduct of our evolution. And yet, because we live with a science that would try to redefine it, that we are stuck with a paradox that we are basically living in a world that is no longer natural, that doesn't reflect the systems that have evolved over time, and yet we're told with the sense that we have to then change according to the whims of our science. If somebody could come along and find a non-toxic way of killing the HIV virus, or somehow or another blocking reverse transcriptase, blocking various different receptor sites, I would be in all in favor of that. But the fact of the matter is that so far, all of the substances have, that have been tried have been more toxic than the nutritional approach alone. I started to find out that there were many alternative treatment options that were working for different people. Different things work for different people. Immune system gets injured primarily by four different mechanisms. Either there are some environmental agents, mold allergy, for example, chemical sensitivities, formaldehyde, or it gets injured by nutritional aspects, not in the narrow sense of nutritional deficiencies. Uh, or the third possibility is the stress uh, element, and the fourth is the problems of lack of physical fitness. So in my, in my clinical management, I emphasize all four areas. The FDA has stated that it will now allow testing of hyperthermia. This after pressure from Senator Lautenberg of New Jersey and Chuck DeMarco and DeMarco's remarkable success. DeMarco had advanced AIDS, in fact was given a death sentence with less than a year to live. Hyperthermia is a treatment where your body is heated up by giving a, an artificial fever. It's been used widely throughout 
the centuries actually and for cancer and other diseases including syphilis and so I went to Italy based upon the advice of the physicians after going through some testing here in the US went through the procedure where my blood was removed from my body in dialysis fashion heated up to about 116 degrees and put back in hot so that uh, a fever could be raised in me above 108 degrees which is the temperature that viruses are begun to uh, die off at the very next day the first thing that was noticed by everybody was that the cough that I had was totally gone and to this day 32 months later it is still gone the KS lesions I had started to form white rings around them and they disappeared uh, the hairy leukoplakia in my mouth was gone within about 48 hours incredible amounts of energy energy to the point where instead of sleeping 18 to 20 hours a day I was sleeping now two to three hours a day my CD4 count the T cell count uh, rose 21 days after the procedure when I was back here in the United States it had gone from 220 to almost 890 and it has remained that way uh, ever since the only times it ever goes down is under stress the other thing is that I had been tested pre-treatment for PCR the, which is a test that checks for DNA for the the virus HIV and that was positive pre-treatment um, the University of Rome uh, December of this past year had tested it and it three times three independent labs in Italy and they have come up three times negative that it is no longer present I do test for the antibodies though which is I think good but uh, everything else has shown that I am now healthy in the making of this documentary I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of individuals using various complementary or holistic therapies everything from ozone to hyperthermia to acupuncture and Chinese herbs, meditation, nutritional diets, macrobiotic diets, vegetarian diets. But most of them have something in common. And what that commonality is, is vitamin C. Now, I'm not talking about a little amount of vitamin C. I'm talking about an IV, intravenous drip of vitamin C. Right now, we're in one of the most popular vitamin C drip centers in the United States. It's the Healing Center on West 72nd Street in Manhattan. Dolores Perry is a registered dietitian, and she's also a certified nutritionist. She has a master's in clinical nutrition from New York University. And Dolores, you have helped hundreds if not thousands of persons with AIDS and chronic fatigue syndrome. You put them on various protocols. You work with their physician in getting them a protocol. And you're a big advocate of vitamin C as a vitamin C drip and that is compared to maybe someone just taking a vitamin C tablet or someone else just trying to get it from orange juice. What's the difference and why do you advocate this? Okay, we can't possibly get enough from just what we eat. Vitamin C is a very unstable vitamin and if you just take it from orange juice we're getting such an insignificant amount. It's uh, what a cockroach might, not, might need. What we need to do is anybody who has any kind of problem, whether it be uh, any kind of virus or anything with a compromised immune system, we got to go to industrial strength vitamin C, which would be the vitamin C drip. And here we're getting from uh, 25,000, 50,000 to 100,000 units of vitamin C. And in the, um, in the vitamin C drip would be B complex, would be glutathione, would be um, a multiple vitamin, and also uh, some, some of the minerals. And then it's, it's bypassing the digestive system and going right to the bloodstream and incorporated into, into the cells and it's just absorbed by the cells. I think that a large percentage of the action of vitamin C, uh, which I like to call ascorbate, uh, to distinguish it from the vitamin C in the sense that vitamin C is with tiny, tiny little doses that are necessary to prevent scurvy. But these huge, massive amounts of ascorbate neutralize free radicals. We've heard a great deal about AZT being able to affect reverse transcriptase or the inhibition of the HIV virus to replicate. What we have not heard are that there are natural substances such as quercetin, pycnogenol, vitamin C, bitter melon, and many others that also do the same. One example would be the work at the Linus Pauling Institute and a Dr. Jarwala who also has been able to effectively destroy the HIV virus from replicating using vitamin C. The results that have been obtained from laboratory studies uh, show a very strong effect of ascorbate on HIV. And uh, the advantages of using ascorbate 
are that it is a safe substance even when administered at very high doses. A lot of doctors, uh, and so and mine also, does not believe in giving me vitamin C be just because if it's not approved. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, without it, I, I know I wouldn't stay stable this long. I look at vitamin drips as a sort of a way of jump-starting the cellular enzymes. In fact, we've done some studies where one group was not treated with intravenous therapy, another group was treated. Intravenous therapy speeds up the recovery process enormously. What we have to do is add to this bag various vitamins and minerals depending on the protocol the, uh, that a patient is under. When we're dealing with AIDS patients, um, we're dealing with people who are severely ill, who generally have very low when we first see them energy levels and we find that one of the major effects of giving vitamin drips is their energy levels will go up. So what we're involved in doing then is just figuring out what is the best ratio of components to put into their particular drip bag. What we see is people walking in here and they're really very very sick and when they come out after they've been here for a while, for a few months or whatever it takes, what a difference. I mean, you see them walking out and they're just dynamite. They have energy, they feel elated, and uh, I work very closely with doctors. So it's not just the vitamin C drip, it's the whole combination. You can't just take one thing and take it out of context. It's taking care of what they're, what's going into their body, their nutrients, their vitamins, and everything that goes in has to enliven. So a typical drip bag has a high volume of vitamin C, anywhere from 25,000 to 100,000 milligrams. It'll also have calcium, magnesium, selenium, zinc, B-complex with B12, folic acid, denison monophosphate, glutathione, taurine. Glutathione is particularly important in AIDS patients because it helps stop the replication of the viruses. I use intravenous glutathione also, and I have all my clients take on a daily basis N-acetylcysteine, which is called NAC. NAC is an amino acid which becomes glutathione in your body. Uh, glutathione is a remarkable substance. It, it deserves all the attention that our government and the NIH is giving it right now. Of course, they're trying to find a glutathione derivative, which they can make a patent for and then make a great deal of profit off of. However, glutathione and NAC work extremely well. Glutathione uh, specifically attacks the AIDS virus from about, at about four different steps. So we're looking at an expanded way of containing and controlling the virus with glutathione. Glycerizin, which is the licorice extract, uh, has been proven to do the same thing. It's just that glycerizin needs to be used in very high doses intravenously, and it gets to be rather expensive, especially considering that it, the insurance companies will, uh, will basically laugh at, at this kind of protocol and refuse to fund it. I've used IV glutathione and glutathione uh, powder and oral administration. I have a very detailed protocol which keeps me alive and stable. I just had an immune uh, test back, which just astounded everyone at my hospital. I use. Uh, garlic, zinc, which is extremely important uh, as an immune system booster, and vitamin A, all in high doses. Actually, the vitamin A is beta carotene, not, not vitamin A. Beta carotene is a safer form, as, as you know. Another uh, lesser known fact is that quercetin, which is a bioflavonoid, ha does have the ability to block reverse transcriptase, which is the way AZT blocks the AIDS virus. So quercetin is a natural person's AZT substitute, and I have all my patients take quercetin on a daily basis. I think that B vitamins are very important in helping the immune system, in avoiding anemia, and especially in avoiding dementia, the mental deterioration that we see with AIDS. I think that people, even early on in the course of their infection, develop problems absorbing many different nutrients, specifically B vitamins and I've developed a B vitamin complex as an injection which all my patients take on a weekly basis to get around the absorption problem. In my five years of practice with some 600 clients, I have never seen dementia in my practice. One modality which is shown to be extremely effective both in combating viral infections and in the overall strengthening of the immune system is the use of medicinal herbs. 
In my own clinical practice with HIV and other viral syndromes, I've had enormous success using intravenous vitamin C, glutathione, the Chinese herb astragalus, St. John's wort, phytolaca, and echinacea. People with uh, HIV and other chronic viral illnesses have a wide variety of herbs from Chinese medicine that have been used for many, many years. Old Inlandia is one of them. It's an antiviral. Honeysuckle flower, which is uh, Lunacera in Latin. Bandlangen in Chinese uh, is uh, Isatis in Latin. These are anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, antibiotic herbs. When we're um, observing people with HIV and their use of Chinese herbs, there have been 10-year studies done in America by Institute for Traditional Medicine, hospitals in Seattle and uh, California in Chicago. They've been observing uh, HIV-positive people for 10 years and their use of the Chinese herbs. 75% of those people uh, report better energy, uh, better immune function, fewer secondary infections. I take my herbs on an empty stomach. I take them with medicinal teas that I have from a Chinese doctor. And then I wait. I uh, run around the house and do what else I have to do. And then I eat, eat something, uh, and uh, drink my juice. I have my juice. And um, then I go on to vitamins, just to keep them separate. Also, vitamins are more readily absorbed with food. I mean, essentially, you should not need any supplementation if you live in a healthy environment and eat well. So you have to treat all of this as food. With AIDS, bitter melon is something that the AIDS community is extremely interested in. What is the role of garlic? What is the role of particular herbs and spices? And so I would love to see this uh, studied, even though perhaps there's not an enormous profit motive to do this. I think that's one of the things that we want to do more and more. And we want to be an advocate for this kind of change. We're working with what the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine calls the new four food groups, which are whole grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables. And these are foods which are very high in antioxidants, which help to boost immune system function, uh, nutrients like beta carotene, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, selenium. These are all plentiful in these foods. For the most part, these nutrients are not found in the high fat, uh, high protein standard American diet. So we're just, uh, we're offering a different point of view. We're trying to get people to look at a new way of eating that is not about providing calories so much as it is about supporting the immune system. We have to look not only at the, the amount of calories that's going in, but the quality of the food, starting with organic. Nobody says much about this, but certainly chemicals are not good for compromised immune system. You have only to look at this food to see that it's full of life. This, um, these greens over here are, are full of the life that came directly from the earth that grew them, and, and the vitality of that food is what nurtures us to go through with our life. For centuries, the Chinese have understood that what makes life itself possible is one's life energy, or qi. Through practices such as Tai Chi and Qi Gong, this life force can be strengthened and enhanced by many different levels. The way one can increase their storehouse of energy is through practicing something like Tai Chi, because um, the process is the, the, the um, environment has energy. And that energy is brought into the system. And it's brought into the system vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, just the simple breathing apparatus. And in the body, the body goes through an alchemical process, uh, converting that to useful chi in the body. Um, it directly, there are uh, organ systems and uh, meridian systems in which one learns to regulate one's chi, basically. So it's, it works that there are five organ systems, and each has its own vibratory patterns and what you do is through practicing Taiji they start to resonate with the core of the vibration in the body and then they harmonize themselves so when you go to a Chinese doctor and they're taking pulses what they're doing is showing the, the different energy levels in different parts of the body 
and hopefully through what they're doing, whether it be acupuncture, or acupressure, or herbs, they're going towards regulating the different energy systems in the body. My interest is not in quantity of life, but quality of life. And Tai Chi Chuan helps people get stronger, helps people stand on their own two feet, and face what's, and deal with some curiosity about what's happening to them. And the cultivation, the reanimation of curiosity in the system helps drive the system. Acupuncture is one therapy that has helped with many of the illnesses related to AIDS because it addresses the causes of symptoms and because it has supported the body's innate self-healing capability. The qi or the bioelectromagnetic energy flows through these pathways and wherever this disease process is occurring, um, you'll find a blockage. So the acupuncture needles inserted in these different points, there are 365 points, um, actually open these pathways and let that energy flow smoothly through those, uh, through those meridians. Um, the other thing that occurs when you're using acupuncture is that it dilates the blood vessels, so the vessels can open, you get more circulation, more of the nutrients, more oxygen flowing through those meridians, which is important in all forms of health. Um, with uh, people that have um, HIV, we're working on some of the immune system points and also just symptomatically working to, uh, to open and energize and bring that life force, that chi, to the various areas that uh, are not working smoothly. The immune system then will start to work to alter the different dysfunctional systems that occur in AIDS patients, such as the lung problem we see, uh, symptoms of TB, uh, pneumonia, some of the dysfunctions of the large intestine, uh, some of the parasites, uh, and the reason that people with HIV do lose weight is because they lose the ability to transmute. The intestine becomes weakened and you don't have the uptake of the nutrients in the small and large intestine. But Chinese medicine addresses this, not just the HIV problem. Yoga is another Eastern practice which is beneficial not only on a physical level, but which also quiets the mind and allows rebalancing and healing on the spiritual level as well. So we're getting two of the basics of yoga, which is proper posture, and proper breathing. So as we're breathing, of course, we're expanding the stomach, and as we're exhaling, we're contracting the stomach, the stomach in. That's to give us a full, deep breath, but we keep it relaxed. And then proper posture, we're making sure we're sitting up, shoulders down and relaxed, good. Imagine someone lifting you up from the top, as though you have a string of light lifting you, and as though somebody else is pressing down at the hips. The two basics, proper posture and proper breathing, are so there's a space for the energy to move throughout the system, so that there's space for the body to relax, to breathe, to just be. Good. Now, as you're in the pose, one thing about yoga, there's always a higher meaning. Think in your life. Use it as a meditation. Where in your life you need to go forward just a little more. Good. Everyone's really relaxing into it. That's right. Let that be as above, so below. As on the physical plane, so on the higher plane. You really need to reach forward a little more. The way you look at the world around you determines the state of your biology under your skin. And that is literally and figuratively true. In other words, you can be in a meditative mode, in a, in a healing self-regulatory mode, and your heart activity, your brain function, your muscle energy, your skin energy, it will all be like uh, cancer's prairie. Or, and, or you can be trying to figure things out, clever way, think your way out, and then your biologic profile is like New York City skyline. Okay? So I call this mode cortical, it is stressful, it, a stressful mode, it causes disease. The other mode is an even steady state energy mode, and that's a restorative mode. In our work, our goal is to, number one, perceive this energy. Number two, to understand how these changes in energy profoundly affect the various electrophysiologic profile. And number three, can we allow this energy to guide us into a healing mode? So we want a transition 
from an ordinary thinking stressful mode which causes disease into a non-thinking meditative deep restorative healing mode that's our goal meditation i do it half an hour every morning and i'm trying to get it to half an hour every night also and uh, it's at least 50 percent of the battle is is your thought process i'm sure there's nothing like the immune system doing its job against this virus. No, one, no amount of AZT can do what your body can do against this virus. I just had an immune uh, test back which just astounded everyone at my hospital because I've now become an immune donor of antibodies with a full-blown AIDS diagnosis. I give antibodies to on a weekly basis so that other people with no immune system can stay alive. It's called passive immune therapy. People who engage in this process heal by scientifically strengthening their immune system and resolving deep issues and conflicts and stuck places inside that from a scientific standpoint may be perpetuating this conditioned immunosuppressive response. When we put the whole piece together, healing happens. It's, it's easy to be discouraged when people see a lot of their loved ones dying and in community, in sharing pain, in recharging with one's spirit and in living life fully hope follows and I I've, I see that happen all the time and I feel it for myself creating hope Gary is a very easy thing to do sustaining hope is difficult I do not believe healing is possible without hope and there we have it these are not the only dissidents I interviewed dozens of other scientists physicians journalists and advocates who also believe, as the individuals you've seen in this documentary, that we have a misguided policy, that politics, special interests, money, ego, self-esteem are behind much of the war on AIDS, and that should change. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Gary Nall.